Hey, Antoinette, why don't you tell me about growing up in New York? New York? Warren, why do you want to know about that? Well, uh, growing up in New York was lots of fun. I loved growing up in New York. I couldn't imagine growing up anywhere else. Really? Um, yeah, really. Uh, the fun things I did, well, lots of movies to go see, but I guess you can see movies anywhere uh, in, in the U.S., anywhere in the world for that matter. Um, I enjoyed being able to go to Lincoln Center for concerts or Carnegie Hall and even play in Carnegie Hall. So I did play in Carnegie Hall. Wow. Wow, that's exciting. Have you ever been to New York? I have. You have? Yeah, I've been there twice. Oh, okay. What did you do when you were there? Uh, the first time, um, I was with my mother. I was 12 years old. Mm. And uh, we went to uh, Central Park, mm. and uh, we saw some museums around Central Park. You didn't go into the museums? Yes, we did go into oh, the museums. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's my park, Central Park. How did you how did you find my park? Did you like my park? Oh, it was great. Yeah. I was surprised how big it was. It is a big park. That's what I like about it. You can get lost in the park and almost forget that you're in a city. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I found really neat about it is sometimes I felt like I was in the countryside. But then I would see large buildings. Yes, yeah, I enjoy that too. Did you know that you could ride horses in the park? No, I didn't. Did you know about the skating rink in the park? Yes, I, I've seen the skating rink on TV. Oh, okay. What time of uh, year did you go? What season? Uh, I've been there in summer and in fall. Okay. But not winter. Uh, it's beautiful in any season, I think. I love Central Park. Yeah, me too. It was, mm -hmm. very, it was a, a memorable experience. Mm, I'm glad to hear that. What other places did you go to? Uh, well, when I was older, I went with my friend, and uh, we went on top of the Empire State Building. Okay. I'm not sure if they allow you to go up there now. Um, that was around 2004. Okay. And we went. Were you able to look over the edge? Um... I don't know if I was looking over the edge. I think it was, it's it's inside, Okay. but you're at the top. Okay, so yeah, things have changed a bit mm. since I was a little girl. Mm. So. Oh, did, what, did it used to be outside that you, you could, could go? You could go outside. There oh. were uh, those binoculars, or I don't know what they're called, but you put a little change in. Right, yeah. And you yeah. can see. Uh, yeah, they had those okay. as well. Yeah. yeah, we could see Central Park. Okay. And, uh, um, you could even see the Statue of Liberty from there. Oh, wow. I've been there. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I never got to go. Both times I went to New York, we yes. wanted to go to the Statue of Liberty, oh. but we didn't have enough time. Oh, well, you should plan another trip. I'd like to. Yeah. yeah. Sounds yeah. great. So thanks for telling me about the ballet and all that kind of stuff, but I'm really more into sports and things like that. Do you know of any other things you can do in New York? Oh, absolutely. There are a lot of uh, events for, for sports enthusi enthusiasts in New York. Um, we've got uh, basketball, the Knicks play. They're uh, an NBA team. Mm -hmm. We've got baseball, the Yankees, and the Mets play. And there's a feud. Fe N Yankees fans hate Mets fans, and Mets fans hate Yankees fans. Right, they have two baseball teams. That's right. Wow. Exciting. We even have a subway series. Well, it used to be a subway series because the uh, teams would play at different stadiums. So they'd go to different stadiums for about a week or so, and the fans would just switch back and forth from one stadium to the other. But I think they recently built one stadium for both teams. Oh. Mm. Do you think one team is more popular than the other? I think probably the Yankees, unfortunately. Oh, the Yankees? Yeah, my family was a, a Mets fan, and don't tell anyone else in my family that I said that. Oh, so I guess they don't get along with each other? Oh, not at all. Oh, no. well. Well, I'm from Canada. I really like hockey. I know you guys have the Rangers. Yeah, we do have the Rangers. They play at Madison Square Garden, so you could easily uh, find buy tickets to see a game there. Uh, that's the same place where the Knicks play, so... Oh, they both play at the same place? Yes, they do. Oh, maybe I could go to a basketball and a hockey game. You probably could if you stayed long enough. I think they have different seasons, right? Oh, do they? Yeah. Madison Square Garden's pretty big, though, so maybe there's more than one arena. I'm not sure. I've only been there 
two or three times in my life. Oh, okay. Well, we also have the U.S. Open, if you like tennis. Right. Um, yeah, that's held in Queens, not in Man on Manhattan. Oh, okay. And what about uh, the the? There's U.S. Tennis Open, but there's also the U.S. Uh, Golf Open. Is that in New York in as New well? In New York, I don't think the U. Is it? I'm not sure. I don't think the the U.S. Uh, open for golf is in New York. I think. Th no, I don't think that's New York. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Hmm. Have you seen the tennis before? Yes, I have. I saw uh, Serena Williams oh, play. She's great. She is, yeah. Powerful woman. Yeah, I'd like to see her play. Yeah. Well, Warren, you know, we've been talking about the fact that we both live in Japan and that we're both from Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, how do you feel about... Uh, Western eating utensils compared to Japanese eating utensils? Well, you know, even in Japan, they, they use Western utensils sometimes. Um, but overall, I do like chopsticks. I, I think it's very handy. Um, it's just easier to, to pick up certain things. When I, when I first came to Japan and saw people eating salad with chopsticks, I thought it was very strange. But if I try to eat it with a fork now, it's actually very difficult to pick up things like lettuce. Mm. And uh, I prefer using chopsticks for things like that. When you first started using chopsticks, did you get hand cramps? Um, not so much because I, I, I can't recall when I started using them, but I actually, I became comfortable with them before coming to Japan. Mm, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, what about, uh, sleeping how do you sleep do you prefer a bed or do you prefer the japanese style stone well it's funny you say that um at first i i hated the idea of this thin little mattress um but i do find it's actually quite nice for my back mm. um i actually prefer it to western beds because it's better for my back but i i don't like sleeping on the floor i like being higher up so a high stone. If work. if I could get like a, you know tatami mat that's raised with a futon yes. mattress on top, that would be best for me. Mm. You know, I think I've seen things like that in the stores. Platform bed with tatami. Oh, that sounds nice. I should look for that. Yeah, I should find one for you and point you in that direction. Well, what about bathing? Uh, the Japanese are famous for their onsens and the way they bathe. So, mm -hmm. do you prefer? A Japanese style uh, bathing situation or a Western style shower? And... Well, I actually much prefer the Japanese style now. When I go back home, I find it quite difficult. Um, I, I like uh, to be able to clean myself before going into the bathtub. Mm, that's a good, a good thing. Mm -hmm. I, I do enjoy that as well. Uh, what about the custom of taking your shoes off? Uh, before going into a house? Well, that doesn't bother me too much. When growing up in Canada, I always took my shoes off um, coming inside anyways. I, I don't think it's as much of a ritual in Canada, but many people do it just to keep a clean house. But sometimes if I run out and I forget something like my car keys and I want to just run back inside, I'll tend to want to keep my shoes on rather than taking them on and off every single time. Okay, tell me. Confess now. Do you sometimes keep your shoes on and go into the house? Yeah, sometimes I have. But I, I've caught my wife doing it a couple times too, and she's Japanese, so hey, I guess I'm not that bad. I don't think so. I do it too. <laughs> what about sitting on the floor versus sitting in chairs? Which do you prefer? Oh, again, I, I really dislike sitting on the floor. It isn't very comfortable for me. I'm a little bit tall. I have long legs, and they... I don't seem to have a place to put my legs when I'm on the floor. Usually my legs will fall asleep quickly and my back will start to bother me. So I, oh. I prefer to sit up in a chair. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, well, I guess my last question is, I guess my last question it refers to eating habits. Well, meals and how they're served. Do you prefer to eat meals that are served to you individually or do you prefer to eat, uh, and share your food? Well, that's a good question, but I don't know if I have a preference. I like the idea of eating all sorts of different things, so it can be fun eating in a, in a Japanese style sometimes, but there are times where I do like to just have my, my own meal in front of me as well. 
So, Antoinette, you've been living in Japan for a while now, right? Yes, that's right. Huh. Well, can you tell me, do you like to use chopsticks or forks and knives more? It depends on what I'm eating, really. Uh, for the most part, I enjoy using chopsticks. They are easy to use. I don't have to worry about cutting anything, and especially if I'm eating Japanese food, which tends to be chopped in small pieces, small bite-sized pieces, chopsticks are perfect. But when I'm eating Western food or spaghetti, I prefer using Western-style utensils. Oh, okay, that makes sense. What about uh, sleeping? Do you like to sleep on like a Western bed or, or a Japanese futon? Actually, it depends on the season. In Why summer, that? well, in summer, I prefer sleeping on a futon. It seems cooler than a bed. But in winter, I love a cozy, plush bed with lots of pillows and quilts or duvets. And yeah, I well, like that, to feel that cozy. That sounds nice. Okay. Mm. How about um, having shoes on or off in the house? Mm, I like to go barefoot. Well, with socks. My feet get cold. Oh, do you use slippers? No. Oh, okay. I find slippers uncomfortable unless they are the kind that fit your foot. They're not actually the correct size for my foot. So. Oh, I see. So Japanese slippers are, are different size for they're, you? They're one size fits all, and I just feel ugh, like ugh, just kicking them off any right. time. Yeah. Oh, okay. How about, uh, you know, in Japan, a lot of times people sit on the floor, um, but you don't really do that very much in, in the United States. Do you like sitting in chairs or, or in the floor more? Mm, I like both, actually. Again, it depends on the season. The floor is so nice and cool in summer, and I like just, just feeling that coolness. But in winter, I want fabric underneath me, and I want cushions. That tends to um, act, uh, provide a barrier for cold wind. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Eating out is a little different too. Uh, I think in in Japan, you tend to share all the meals that you have, but maybe back home, you usually just buy one meal. That's true. Uh, maybe I'm a germ-phobic American. I don't know. I like eating my own food. I don't oh. like to share. If it's one huge serving plate that's meant for several people, then fine, but I like just having my own plate of food. Oh, okay. Um, what about uh, having a shower or a bath. I think in Japan they usually um, have like a detachable shower head and and uh, you can shower yourself before going into a bath. Mm. What do you prefer? Well, I like showers either way as long as the water is hot. Uh, whether it's detachable or not, as long as the water is hot, I like showers. And I like having water run down my body. That's a pleasant feeling so but I also like sitting in a hot tub of water but well, not for too long what about the the bathtubs because I think they're they're different sizes aren't they they are I like the fact that Japanese baths allow you to sit in water up to your neck but I also like the fact that Western style baths allow you to recline in the water right you can stretch so out you more? can stretch out yeah oh, okay I see uh, that's a hard, hard call. So Jeremy, uh, you mentioned earlier that you've been back to Canada with your baby. Mm -hmm. How was that experience? Well, I mean, until you fly with a, with a toddler, you really not, never get to appreciate all of those times that you flew across the ocean, uh, you know, watching movies or reading magazines <laughs> or just sleeping on the flight because those days are over. Wow. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not that bad, but when you're on the plane, you say never again. Mm. Um, I remember about halfway into a 10-hour Trans-Pacific flight, I thought, well, I can maybe do this every three years, but <laughs> not more than once a year, for sure. Mm. I mean, first of all, our boy was, was bigger than most children at, for his age, so he was about one year old. And, um, you know, they have these uh, bassinets that you're, you're allowed to put your child in and, you know, the baby will hopefully sleep for a while. Mm. So the stewardess sets up the bassinet, we're all ready to put him in there. And then she says, how old is he? And he was 12 kilos and this was for 11.5 maximum. Oh, and no. they wouldn't let us put him in there. Oh. So they had to take the whole thing apart and basically 
uh, we had to find some way to have him sleep on our laps for oh, the next wow. nine hours. So, I mean, you know, one-year-olds like to crawl around. They like to scream. They like to cry. Um, other people on the flight don't like that so much. So, you know, it's 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 basically every minute of silence you just savor mm. and just pray that this will keep going and it never <laughs> does. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, once he falls asleep and, and uh, the plane's quiet and they turn off the lights, then, you know, it's okay. But it's too long. It's too long for a one-year-old. So um, I, I, I can maybe manage it once a year, but mm. that's, that's about it. Mm. I remember my sister, she has two kids, and she told me a story a few years back when one of her daughters was still a toddler and they went to Disneyland mm. from Canada and she said it was just horrible and they would never do it again. And I just smiled. I, I didn't have that experience. I was just thinking, what could be so bad about it? Yeah. But hearing your story now, wow, I can only imagine. Well, I've, I think that actually most people, most passengers on a flight are usually quite understanding. Mm. And I think it's just you know, in the parents' head that everybody's judging That's them, true. everybody's looking true. at them. Um, because, you know, I get so worried about what other people are thinking that mm. I'm inconveniencing others that I just work myself up so much. And my wife's the same way. But, you know, talking, is, actually, we did have people say to us, like, um, y you know, don't worry about it. Aww. And they, they would just go out of their way to say, oh, what a cute baby and stuff like that. So I think people were kind of aware of how stressful it is for parents and they just, you know, some people actually uh, make an effort to make parents feel like everybody's not silently judging them or okay. maybe not even silently. <laughs> <laughs> not saying anything. If you had an advice, one advice to give to a parent that would travel with a child in the future, what would you tell them? My best advice is if you can fly uh, in the morning, so after baby wakes up and you have your breakfast and your flight's maybe at... I don't know, nine or 10 in the morning. I think that works out best if it's a say 10 hour flight because you'll you'll land and it'll be probably around bedtime, like it's okay. normal bedtime. The first time we did it, the flight was in the late evening. So basically he'd been up all day mm -hmm. and then there was another 10 hours on top of that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when we landed, the readjustment to his, his normal schedule was really, really difficult. But when we flew in the morning and uh, it was a 10 hour flight, when we landed, he just basically went to sleep okay. uh, like a normal schedule. So that's a small thing, but it really makes a big difference. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy, I, I heard you have a new baby. Congrats on that. Thanks. So how has uh, fatherhood changed you in any way? Uh, you know, it, it's changed me probably in every way. Mm. Um, the, the, you know, when you think of how your life is different it, it's basically from when you wake up until well you eventually get to go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> everything is different um but you know it, everything about it is positive even things that you'd think would annoy you um actually aren't really that annoying like mm -hmm. having a a toddler come and wake you up at six o'clock in the morning when you've um, when you've got a cold and you've taken a bunch of sleeping mm. medication the night before, <laughs> like which happened in this morning. <laughs> and even that, having a toddler wake you up and just looking at you and laughing, it's, it's awesome. It mm. really it really is awesome. So, you know, I always kind of worried before when I, when, you know, when I was thinking about having a kid about all these things. Oh, I can't go out at night or I'm going to have to wake up so early in the morning and I'm going to be woken up in the middle of the night by a screaming child. All of that stuff really doesn't bother me. Mm. It, it's, it just, you know, it's part of the, the experience. And yeah, sometimes maybe I'd like to sleep a little bit longer. But yeah, waking up and then having a little guy sit on my lap while uh, he plays with the remote control and changes <laughs> channels over and over again. I mean, that's <laughs> that's somehow a very very enjoyable experience. But wow. um, you know, it's it's you get to see a, a little person change every day mm. and start figuring things out and of course every person every parent thinks that their child is the smartest child in the world because <laughs> he can turn off and on the the light switch you know <laughs> but it's those types of things that you just marvel at so mm -hmm. um you know i can i can say like most people that it's 
everything about it is is very positive but it's often just the really really small things that mm -hmm. that uh, make you appreciate Kay. this little little wonder mm -hmm. and looking back on the experience now what are some things that you would uh, wish you had known oh. you wish you had known before your little boy came along yeah that's a good question um you know I was so stressed out for the first couple of weeks mm -hmm. after he was born and from the from the moment he was born um, until you know he came back home and then for the first number of weeks that he was home we basically just hovered over him for weeks and um, you know of course you have to be protective and careful of a, of a newborn baby but not everything mm -hmm. was as serious as we thought it was and you know, crying, we were worried about waking up our neighbors or we were worrying that, you know, something was seriously wrong. Babies cry. And <laughs> if, you, if you really get stressed out about it, then you're going to make your life miserable. Mm. So, you know, having done it once, just realizing that, you know, kids cry, kids get sick, kids throw up, kids need their, you know, their nappies changed. Mm. Um, I would just take a deep breath if I had to have to do it again and just realize okay, this is just part of the experience and uh, you just got to roll with it, so. Okay, that's great. So, Amy, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and they, they told me that you'd had uh, quite a number of, like, um, interesting little odd jobs. Um, so, like, I'm interested. Could you uh, tell me a bit about that? I don't know how odd how odd they were. I don't know. When I was in university, um, part-time jobs, I used to work in restaurants and, you know, usual stuff, restaurants. And I think my favourite was working in a nightclub. Um, it was a really, really big nightclub. And I used to work on the floor, just kind of cleaning up, um, looking after all the drunk patrons. And on my first night there, it was, it was actually one of my favourite DJs was on. So that was great. Um, I got to listen to really good music whilst finding money on the floor <laughs> and cleaning up after folk it was really good you found some money on the floor yeah you know it was a busy club really really full a good couple of thousand people in there and mm. um i guess people were doing whatever they were doing and they would drop big wads of cash and because i was the person to clean up all the the glass bottles then i would find the wads of cash on the floor so it was it was good. I'd get my wages, I'd get tips, and then I would get my own personal tips from finding <laughs> finding money on the floor. So like you must have found like a, a whole range of like you know different things. Like what else did you what else did you find? Yeah, little wraps of things and uh, packets of things. Um, yeah, I, mean, I had to I had to work hard for the money. It wasn't easy uh, because the place was full, absolutely rammed of people. Everybody's incredibly drunk or whatever. And um, they're all just wanting to dance and have a good time. And I have to make sure there's no broken glass um, for safety reasons, obviously. So I'm pushing my way through the crowd and keeping my eyes on the floor constantly with a torch. And uh, alongside the broken glass that I would sweep up would be, yeah, wads of cash, sometimes little purses, little bags, things like that. When I found like, identification for things when it was a purse i would you know do the right thing with it I'd hand it in but if it was just a, a wad up like a rolled up set of notes i would just put them in my pocket for for me basically yeah, it's difficult to know what to do with cash because you know you hand it into someone who mm -hmm. well it's cash isn't it so, i know yeah yeah when i found um I remember finding some uh, a driving license and uh, student ID and I took, it was actually the same university that I went to at the time and I just took it to uni when I was going in during the week and I handed it in to make sure that it, it got back to the owner because, you know, that's the worst thing about when you lose your purse or your wallet, um, the cash you can kind of just say goodbye to. It's a given, really, that it's going to be gone, but it's your ID and your cards and everything. It's mm -hmm. such a hassle trying to get them back again. So I wanted to make sure that whoever, whatever drunken idiot dropped them in that club that it got yeah. back to their hands safely. Oh, that's nice. So you're a thief with heart then? I'm not a thief. <laughs> an opportunist. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's on the floor. Oh, I'm pulling your leg. I'm pulling your leg. No, I would have done the same. 
So, Paul, what's the most memorable job experience that you have? Hmm. Well, I think the most memorable was the um, is the uh, volunteering um, time that I spent in Australia, and um, I was up in the northeastern corner where there's um, well a relatively small rainforest, and I was helping with a research station uh, that's located in the rainforest. Um, so. <clears throat> we do a range of different things, um, going from um, trying to control uh, coconuts, coconut trees. Control? Yeah, because, like, believe it or not, you, you imagine these kind of tropical paradises to, to have coconut trees, mm -hmm. but they're actually very invasive and they're not native to that, that area. Oh. And basically, if you let a um, you know a population of coconuts coconut trees to go out of control mm. nothing else can grow oh uh, you know they drop their fawns and they they drop their obviously the coconuts mm -hmm. and uh, nothing else can grow so you basically lose uh, a lot of the native species there so trying to keep them under control uh, we there was also um, caring for bats that had been uh, orphaned uh, sometimes they're born you know with um, physical disabilities that mean they can't survive in the wild so right. like a sanctuary it's, then it's like a sanctuary yeah yeah so they take care of what size of bats like Indiana uh, Jones style fruit bats <laughs> what size are they uh, they're pretty like one once they spread they're like little monkeys with uh -huh. big wings yeah so what's their wingspan like um how <laughs> let's say maybe i guess up to probably four four feet does that sound too much is that about a meter yeah meter each side? like the, the, some of the big the the big you know the big dudes yeah yeah they're, they're, they've got a huge wingspan uh, the only bats i've seen in real life are really tiny they're just like little uh, mice the micro bats, they're, they're like yeah. little birds you know yeah, you see them flying yeah. around you think oh that's birds no the bats mm. so these guys sound pretty big mm. <laughs> but they're completely like um herbivorous they only eat fruit right so like they're really you know do they eat the coconuts <laughs> Uh, well, the coconuts are kind of tough for them to yes. to get into, you know. You need to be able to make a hole, I suppose, course, to get yeah. there, yeah. But they eat all, mostly like fleshy fruits, you know, apples or whatever they can get, really. Mm -hmm. Berries and they're really important for spreading because obviously they eat the, the flesh mm -hmm. of the fruit, but they don't eat the seeds. Okay. So they just kind of pass through them. Okay. And they're really useful for dispersing seeds. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, rainforests, uh, regeneration, um, they're very important, you know, animals. So look, they're like the, the big bumblebees of the rainforests then? Yeah, I guess you could look at it like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was an interesting uh, volunteering kind of... Um, odd job that I had I suppose yeah that sounds yeah, really good yeah. really cool I really like to go back there someday have you heard about singles day in China no I'm not really sure can you explain what that is about so this is a new, a new holiday that's been created for single people wow and so on this day people don't buy presents for somebody else they buy presents for themselves they're celebrating being single and it's been a huge success Wow. Like the, the the internet sales have just gone through the roof. Huh. So I guess companies just look for a time of year where there's maybe no ho holiday at the moment and try to create a new holiday. That's true. And sell more goods. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting idea. It sounds like something you would do normally anyway, mm. right? Right. We always yeah. shop for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, but wow. I heard actually that, that Mother's Day mm -hmm. was, this might be an urban myth, but it was created by the Hallmark card company in America because there was a gap in the year where people weren't buying cards. Huh. And so they created this Mother's Day. Everyone's got a mother. That's true. And if, you know, if they create this Mother's Day, everyone's going to feel obliged to buy a card for their mother. 
That's true. And now it's because I don't know if it's true, but that's what it <laughs> but I I say it's true because I think it's a huge hit mm-hmm. in a lot of countries actually, yeah. and it's spreading more and more to mm-hmm. different countries every year. Yeah. So these companies are definitely onto something. Yeah. They know what they're doing. Right. Right. So what should we do? I can't boycott Christmas because <laughs> I love Christmas too much. <laughs> But maybe we could boycott some of these other days. Maybe. Or just celebrate it in a way that's less commercialized. Mm-hmm. I guess we don't always have to buy big things. Mm-hmm. What about quality quality time? Yeah. Spending time with family, mm-hmm. with friends, and just appreciating them in different ways mm-hmm. than what we would think of just shopping mm-hmm. or gifts and presents. Yeah. That Material like a things. Yeah. Nice idea. Yeah, I think so. We'll save us some money, definitely. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, Rory... Do you think holidays these days, do you think they're too commercial? What do you think? I mean, they are really commercial, aren't they? Like Christmas, mm-hmm. especially. Mm-hmm. It seems to start earlier and earlier every year. So now you you know, you know you hear Christmas songs like in November, That's maybe true. even October. And the stores start to have decorations. Is it too commercial? I don't know. I love Christmas, mm. you know. So I love all the Christmas lights. Okay. But there is a lot of pressure on people to spend a lot of money at Christmas. That's true. I think I'm with you on that. I love Christmas. I love everything Mm -hmm. that comes with it. The songs, the food, the family time. So I can't really complain about it. But I think the year, the calendar year, has Mm -hmm. just become one big holiday thing. Mm. Where you start off in, I don't know, you start whenever. December, Christmas finishes. And we're already looking forward to Valentine's Day. Right. Valentine's yeah. Day finishes St. Easter. Yeah. East St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. So it's like one continuous mm-hmm. holiday coming up right after the yeah. other. Yeah. So. And things like St. Patrick's Day. When I was a kid, my family's Irish. Oh. We never celebrated St. Patrick's Day at all. I mean, nothing. Didn't huh. even talk about it. But now all the pubs and the bars have promotions. The restaurants have promotions. You know, you buying green beer, <laughs> people are wearing funny hats. It seems to me like completely a commercial holiday. That's true. It doesn't seem to be related to St. Patrick at all. That's true. That's true. Why do you think it's becoming more and more like that? I guess that uh, companies just see it as a way mm-hmm. to, to, sell more, to sell more products. Mm-hmm. So, Paul, speaking of technology... How long do you think you can go without checking your phone? Uh, it's quite embarrassing, really, if I'm honest. Um, I check it a lot. I really do. Like, really? I'm always having a look at Facebook, my emails. I'm looking at the football news <laughs> online. Yeah, it, I mean, it's not something I'm proud about, but it's something that, yeah, it's quite a big part of my life, I think. If you left the house and mm. you had forgotten your phone, mm. would you feel something really missing? I did actually. I forgot my. Um, I use my iPad a lot, and um, I forgot my iPad the other day, just as I was leaving, and my bus was about to arrive, and I really had this strong like pull um, to go back for it, but um, I, I caught myself and uh, decided that yeah, I can I can manage without it, you know, for one day. Could you manage? Yeah, I did. I didn't even think about it, actually. It was just that, you know, that sort of momentary pull yep. where I thought I needed it. Yeah. And then actually having, you know, sort of considered it seriously, it was like, well, I don't need it. So, yeah, I did I did fine without it. I didn't <laughs> yeah. have to be, like, hooked up to a life support system or anything. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing, really, how it comes to kind of be such a central part in your life. How long do you think you could go without using the internet? Um, I check my phone thousands of times a day. <laughs> to exaggerate, didn't say thousands. I, I check it too much, I think, far too much. If I left my phone at home, I would feel gutted. <laughs> I would feel like I'm really, really missing something. It would definitely be a big, big pull, mm. I think. Um, I read a lot of things on the internet and I check things um and yeah when it's not there then i do feel like something is maybe i should be doing something or i'm missing out on something and it's not good i'm emba- i'm embarrassed actually it's it's not good at all 
So yeah. I think I need to work on, un, yeah, unplugging. <laughs> mm. I've heard a lot of people, um, they try to do at least one or two days a week where they don't use, you know, the internet at all. Uh-huh. Um, but that, that sounds like it could be quite a good idea. Um, yeah. you know, maybe just, you know, unplug. Yeah. Yeah. Do I'm you really, think you could? I think I could. Yeah. I think I could. In fact, I really like, um, hiking and, mm -hmm. uh, being outdoors. And, um, I think one of the things that I really love about it is that I'm, nobody can contact me, you know? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm kind of away from everything and uh, yeah I really in, in enjoy those moments mm, yeah I don't know if I could <laughs> I would have to cut down before going cold turkey I think <laughs> I'd have to cut down I'm trying to cut down I'm you know I mentioned before I'm trying to get back into reading mm. um, just get back into real books instead of screen time mm. so yeah I couldn't go cold turkey I think a couple of days a week I would need to cut down <laughs> yeah 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 I think we should probably um, yeah make a concerted effort I think it's probably good for us to try to reduce our you know user time yep mm. um, so Amy do you do you always check your emails in the morning um, probably Probably. Recently, mm. I'm trying to stop using my electronic devices so much. Mm. So I think in the morning I need to do other things. Yeah. But very often I will quickly scan my phone mm. and check because my phone is also my alarm clock. So it's right there. It's, right, right, it's too right. handy. <laughs> yeah. I'm always when I wake up, I, I don't know, I've got this really bad habit where I think something major's happened during the night. <laughs> and so I wake up from checking like you know different websites and uh, checking Facebook to uh -huh. see if there's been any messages or any great news over oh, the really? course of the night yeah it's a really bad habit you know it starts to kind of dominate your life you know yeah I think it's quite a uh, addictive mm -hmm. thing isn't it yeah I've been yeah. thinking about it a lot recently and it's something I think that doesn't need to be in the morning routine so much mm. it's good to just get your head ready before you mm. your head and your body ready before you start thinking about yeah. checking emails and stuff I agree mm. I heard somebody there was a piece of advice I can't remember where I heard it from but um, it was just to check your email twice a day you know, mm -hmm. you don't need to do more than that. Mm -hmm. you know, check once in the morning, once in the evening, that's it. Mm -hmm. you know? Check your, you know, news websites maybe twice a day mm -hmm. rather than, you know, every 30 minutes or something. You know? Yeah, so, that's... Yeah, I think it requires di discipline, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It's yeah. good advice. Yeah. But I don't know if it's very practical because if you're using... Um, a smartphone which I do mm. then you're using it for it's got so many different functions mm. and you you need it for well need it I guess mm. it's a loose term but mm. you use it for right. so many different things yeah so it's always there you know mm. always there yeah however I, I did start reading a book the other day so I'm trying to stop looking at my phone and start reading a book oh, instead good for you. Yeah. <laughs> thanks that's a good move yeah 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 I should perhaps do that myself yeah yeah so Jeremy you you don't have a car now but you had a car when you were younger how do you find that well I mean the reason I don't have a car now is because of money I I can't afford a car at this point but it's been many years since I actually owned a car and I've gotten really used to taking public transit and, you know, when you don't have a car for several years, you just get, get used to it. And then I can sort of justify it to myself saying, well, I'm doing my part for the environment. I'm not emitting all those, all those emissions <laughs> into the atmosphere. So, you know, this is my small, small part for the world. But then when I think about how I can't take a road trip up into the mountains or go to the ocean or just enjoy my freedom or... I can't have 15 minutes where I get to listen to my own music and sing along in the car or just have that time to spend to myself. 
I really, really miss it.、Mm. Honestly, it.、Uh, Some of my best times from my youth were actually just driving around with my friends, and I don't get that anymore. And even just to go out and you know pick something up from the supermarket on a rainy day, I don't have that convenience anymore. So, I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world not having a car, but sometimes I really, really miss it. Mm. What about you, Abby? I mean, I know you have transit, or you have transportation now. <laughs> How do you enjoy that? That's true. I think my story is the opposite of yours, actually, Jeremy. For the longest time, I did not have a car or transportation. All I had was my bike or walking、mm. everywhere. And although I enjoyed that, I envied my friends who had cars and could just take off at any moment,、mm. go wherever they wanted to. Now I have a scooter, and I absolutely love it.、Mm. I would prefer a car on some days. It's true on those rainy days or when it's really cold、mm. and I need、um, the heat of a car. But the、um, convenience of having my scooter and the fact that it's so cheap,、yeah. I can go anywhere, anytime. I don't have to look for parking. Parking is free. I can leave it on the side of the road somewhere and find it there, and don't have to pay for parking. Or、mm. yeah, I really enjoy that. And It just feels cooler.、Yeah. I think wherever I live, wherever I go now, I would even if I do buy a car someday, I would always want to have a scooter or a motorbike because it's just something I don't know, <laughs> exciting. <laughs> As a scooter driver, though, do you ever feel intimidated by the cars on the road? I mean, is it dangerous? Do you think driving a scooter?、Around? That is a very good question. It's true. When you talk about road rage, people be <laughs> road rage is one thing when it's car versus car,、mm. but when you're on a scooter and you can't go as fast as the other drivers and they're behind you,、right. although they're very polite sometimes, they don't honk, but you can feel them、mm. coming behind you. So I try to drive as close to the edge as possible. At times, I've just had to pull over because I don't want you to hit me.、Mm. I know you want to get to where you want to go, and you're faster than me. So I just pull to the side, let the car pass, and just go my way. So it's true; it is safety. You have to be really safe and conscientious, and you just have to pay attention to what you're doing. Sounds like you have the right attitude as a. I try.、Driver. I try. <laughs> I want to be safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Have you ever been in an accident? Um, not a car accident. I was in in a, a bicycle accident. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of I laugh now, but at the time it was it was pretty bad. Uh huh. What happened?、Um, it was dark and、um, it was Christmas Day, and、um, I was on my bicycle going down quite a steep slope, and、uh, my telephone rang, and I looked at my you know my my mobile phone,、uh -huh. and I took it out of my pocket whilst. Riding my bike、uh -huh. and looked at it and noticed it was my dad and he was ringing to wish me, a, you know, a, a happy Christmas.、Uh -huh. So I felt sort of,、um, you know, compelled to answer the phone.、Um, so answering the phone, still going down the hill,、oh. probably gathering speed.、Uh, it's dark and I'm, you know, trying to get my dad off the phone as soon as I can. <laughs> and before I knew it,、um, I. Drove straight into the back of a, a parked、uh, black car. Oh no! I, I saw at the very last minute, you know. So I hit the back of it, and my body、um, slammed into the ground, and I broke、um, a few bones. Yeah, oh no! Yeah, yeah, it was pretty. It was a pretty miserable Christmas, to be honest with you. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it's the worst. Yeah. <gasps> Did the owner of the car see what happened? Did he damage the car? I didn't stay along long enough. <laughs> I, I,、uh, yeah, I, I got out of there and went to the pretty, hospital pretty quickly. No, I, I was a bit stubborn. I don't know why. It was, it was the worst night's sleep I've ever had. But,、uh -huh. um, yeah,、uh, I didn't go. I didn't go to the hospital until the next day. What bones? Did you break?、Uh, broke my、um, collarbone,、oh. the clavicle,、oh, and I broke a, a few ribs. Oh no, ribs! That's the worst because they、yeah. can't do anything for it. They、yeah. just send you on your way, and you just、mm. have to cough in pain.、Mm. Oh no! Yeah, but it could have been a lot worse, you know. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I could have broken my neck. So, how long did it take you to recover?、Um, it took me about、um, what six weeks, I suppose. Yeah, because then、um, actually, 
in the following, because it happened on Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. So three months later in the March, I was um, I was lucky enough to w- win a place in the Tokyo Marathon. And I really wanted to do it because it's quite difficult to get. It's like a lottery. You yeah. know? There's so many people who apply to get a position. So I wasn't going to let this accident stop me from, from running the, the Tokyo Marathon. So I was trying to rush it, really. And um, I shouldn't have, but I did. I, I ran it. And, did you uh, yeah i finished it but um congratulations but yeah. how how were you though that must have really hindered your recovery it, it hindered my train it hindered my training period yeah for, for the marathon yeah yeah so but you finished it though i finished it yeah well done i wouldn't do it again marathons <laughs> are miserable things to do <laughs> really you know like, why why put yourself through that like, pain you know <laughs> Um, I still like running, so maybe in the future I'd do a, a half marathon or something. Yeah, but a full marathon, my my marathon days are over. I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was um, on my way to work the other day, and um, I saw this um, really. You shouldn't laugh, but it was quite funny. Um, traffic accident. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> And this, uh, I, should, I shouldn't laugh, but this um, old lady was in her car and bless her, she must have got confused and she put the, uh, the car into reverse. <gasps> and when she meant to like put the car in, in, you know, forward gear. Yeah. And she drove like straight into the person behind her. Oh, no. And uh, smashed up the car <gasps> behind her, you know. I mean, it was an innocent mistake. But, you know, it could happen to any of us, but it was a bit sort of, um, you know, calamitous, really. Um, how about you? Have you had any car accidents or...? Um, not not like that. I've been in a car. I was a passenger in a car accident um, when I was about 17. My boyfriend at the time was driving too fast and on a country road with the national speed limit. So he was going pretty fast and then we were pulling into a small village so he had to slow right down the roads were very very wet it was dark he came up over a small hill and there was a big jeep suddenly waiting to turn right and he he stamped on the brakes and skidded right into the back of it so his little car just got demolished by this jeep um we were okay he hit his head off the steering wheel and i think i had seat belt pain from where the seat belt was but yeah the car was a write-off but we were okay wow thank thank goodness for that <laughs> sounds like you sounds like it's pretty horrific <laughs> no no it was okay yeah. it oh. taught him to i guess be a better driver he was driving too fast mm. on slippery and dark conditions so yeah i guess when you're at that age you almost feel like you're a, you know you're untouchable mm. you know nothing can stop you so sometimes you need those sorts of experiences to kind of make you realize that, you know. Don't be a boy uh, racer. <laughs> don't be a boy racer. And, uh, you know, it, it could be taken away from you. Your life could be taken away from you very easily, you know. Yeah. It's pretty. Um, yeah, we were really lucky, for yeah. sure. So you were 12 when you came to Canada. That's right. Um, do you remember anything that was either really similar or really different from how teachers taught or from the classroom experience were they more or less the same or were they shockingly different actually i think they were different in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. for some reason i had finished uh, my grade six which is like primary six they called in nigeria which is the end of high school no sorry the end of elementary school Mm -hmm. in nigeria so when i came to canada they put me into grade seven Mm -hmm. thinking it's the next level But my level was higher, so they put me into grade 8 after that. So I got to skip a grade, which is really great. But I remember in terms of um, the way of thinking, in my English literature class, we had a composition. And we had to finish a story. And it was like, uh, suddenly something appeared in the sky. What is it? And all my classmates wrote, it's a UFO. (laughs) For me, I'd never heard of a UFO. So they were like, it's a UFO. It, It, like make somebody disappear it picked up somebody and one of their classmates another person disappears but my essay i'm like it was it was just weird i had a totally different way of thinking and processing things 
And that really surprised my teachers mm. because when they wrote my composition, they compared it to the rest of the class, to my classmates. And they were like, wow, this is interesting that you're all the same age and we're all speaking the same language, but the way we view things is very different. Mm. And I guess to me as well was my first exposure to cultural differences. And then after that, many years later, coming to Japan and being different again in a different setting, it made me think back to that time thinking, wow, you can't always expect same things. Like differences come in weird places sometimes. So yeah, that's one thing I remember. Okay. But a lot of things were the same, but the same, yeah, okay. different. So, I mean, just in terms of sort of the, the simple things in life, when mm -hmm. you came to, to Canada, were there any foods or drinks that you were particularly fond of right away or thought were particularly strange? Mm -mm -mm. Very good question. Um, food, a lot of food was all right, mm. right off the bat. Like, we didn't have any difficulties with that. But one thing I do remember was uh, nacho chips. Ah. We were not used to cheese, the taste of cheese. So my sisters and I, what we would do is we would buy nacho chips, like Doritos. Uh -huh. I don't know if everyone knows that. And we would wash it <laughs> because the, the cheesy taste was strange. So we would wash it before eating it and then we would eat it. And I had some friends who would just stare at us like, what's the point? Why would you buy that flavor of chips? That's the whole point, <laughs> to, to taste that. But we were like, no, we can't eat this. <laughs> But eventually, now, I love Doritos. I've grown accustomed to the taste. <laughs> you probably made it healthier, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, Abhi Demi, you're, you were born in Nigeria, but you moved to Canada and did most of your schooling in Canada. That's right. Can you tell me a little bit about what the transition was like coming from Nigeria to Canada and, and uh, doing a Canadian education system? Sure. Um, for me, it was an interesting experience, both great and at the same time, hmm, I don't want to say traumatic, but very different in terms of lifestyle. Since I was very young, I had loved traveling. I wanted to travel. So when my family decided to make the move to Canada, I was really excited, mm -hmm. but I have to say I wasn't really prepared. I had no idea. Where is Canada, America, England? They were all the same to me right. at that age. So when we moved and uh, my dad had initially made the move, he went ahead of us. He got a job. He found a place for us to live. And then I arrived with my mom and my other sisters. There were five girls and we arrived at the airport. And my first memory is looking out mid-December in Montreal. We arrived at Montreal airport and looking out and seeing this white thing covering the ground and thinking, what is that? Why is it so white? And I remember saying to my dad as he drove up to drive us home, let's play in that. I want to play in that. What is that? So that was my first memory of uh, Canada, of the snow. Mm. And uh, it was fun. It was great arriving in December, but at the same time, it was very cold. Personally, I'm not somebody that likes the cold too much. But having the warmth of my family in the midst of that cold made it worth it. It was awesome. And then at school... Making the transition was a little harder. At that time, the school we went to, there were not a lot of minorities. Mm. So I think some of the teachers and some of the students weren't sure how to get um, accustomed to us. And we weren't sure what to expect either. Mm. But everyone tried their best and um, we flourished. And I went on to high school and then did university. Mm. And one of the things was having my teachers, like we were talking about before, recognize the potential in me and my sisters and really encouraging us and uh, being with my classmates and making friends and having fun with them. And during that time, it was the um, late 90s and uh, there were a lot of transitions going on in other parts of the world. So people from different countries, like I remember we had a lot of people from uh, Bosnia mm -hmm. because of the war coming to my high school and from other uh other parts of the world like from Asia mm. so it was a really multicultural school high school that I went to so learning about other cultures through my friends too made it really worth it mm. so I'm, I'm certainly glad that my family made the move it's opened up amazing opportunities for me as well 
and being able to come now to Japan and teach English.、Mm. That was because of that. So, yeah, although it was hard in ways that I hadn't imagined, but it was so worth it.、Mm. And I've grown and I've had so many awesome experiences that, yeah, I'm really thankful for it. So, Jeremy, we both work in Japan, and、uh, I was just talking about how it feels like to go home. How, how does it feel like for you, Jeremy? Well, when I go back to Canada, really the first thing that I notice is the air.、Mm. And it's a funny thing to think, but I know when I arrive in Vancouver and I walk out of the airport,、um, I can smell West Coast Canada air. And it really gives a kind of positive feeling to me.、Um, You know, that's it's, it's a small thing, but you notice how clean it's not. I know it's a stereotype of Canada, but、um, it really is such a clean place. And also, Vancouver, you have the smell of the ocean and you, you know, have the mountains right there. So that's the first thing that I always notice. But when I go back and I visit my parents,、um, you know, it takes me about 10 minutes to get used to <laughs> where I am being back home.、Um, you know, it doesn't take long at all. And I think it's because that's the house that I grew up in. And、uh, just, you know, the feeling that I grew up with, it returns immediately. You know, it goes away when I'm away, when I'm living in Japan. But as soon as I get back home, that feeling of comfort comes back within, within minutes. And,、uh, you know, I look forward to the same thing that everybody looks forward to when they go back home.、Um, And food is right at the top of that list.、Um, you know, I, I honestly look forward to turkey dinner maybe more than anything in the world,、mm. or、uh, prime rib, or those types of things.、Um, but it's just the small things, you know, having, having、uh, mom make a snack or something like that, and、uh, just the feeling of, of being completely at ease and without a, without a worry in the world is, is kind of. What I most look forward to going back home. So,、um, you know, it, there's other things when you, when you go out and you go to the stores and you, you circulate around town.、Um, it, it does feel a little bit like you're an alien in your own <laughs> town. And I mean, but that's a feeling that I never mind. You know,、mm-hmm. it's, I, I have no problem being a foreigner in my own, in my own home now. I,、mm-hmm. I kind of enjoy the feeling. And sometimes I even wish that I, that I didn't speak the language everybody else was speaking because <laughs> I don't want to hear everybody's conversations,、mm-hmm. to be honest.、Mm-hmm. But、um, no, the feeling of being in my house or my parents' house is really a feeling that is just complete comfort.、Mm. How often do you get to go back home?、Now? Well, just because of the cost,、mm-hmm. um, I can probably only go back once a year. And also, we have a,、uh, an infant boy and、mm. traveling with a one year old on a. 10 hour flight is until you do it, you really never realize how <laughs> terrible it is. But、um, it is uncomfortable.、Mm. It is really uncomfortable. So, yeah, we're, we're only able to make it back to Canada probably once a year now. But,、um, you know, his grandparents love seeing him so much that we,、uh, that we want to do it as much as we possibly can.、Mm. I guess the fact that you can't go as often as you would like makes it even much more. Worthwhile when、It's、you do、true. get to go. It's true. Yeah.、Um, just uh, the, the expense and the time that we have to put in、um, while you're there, you basically savor every second. You don't want to sleep. You just want to enjoy it. So,、mm-hmm. yeah, it's,、um, yeah, it's a pretty special experience going back home now. That's awesome.